Hello and welcome to this uh, first clip, my first attempt at uh, a, a chemistry Olympiad round one paper, um, or rather to an, an attempt at doing a tutorial clip on it. Uh, I'd want to point out that this is only my interpretation of the questions and how I might go about attempting them if I was taking the paper myself. I, I'd also want to say it's not an official mark scheme, it hasn't been endorsed by the Royal Society of Chemistry, but if you were to go to the RSC's Learn Chemistry website, you can find the mark scheme for this particular paper and check it against this clip. So as in any chemistry Olympiad paper, it's well worth actually reading all of the information first before you start. Because what this does is it introduces the science and the ideas behind what you're about to be asked about. So the first piece of chemistry that comes from the A-level syllabus is 2-methylpropane nitrile. And it also says it was found to be approximately 0.4 times as abundant as its straight chain isomer. So the molecule was detected from the radio signals given out as it dropped from an excited energy level to a lower one. Now that part you don't have to worry too much about, but essentially what it means is the electrons within the, the atoms are being excited by being struck by energy from outer space. And then it says a nitrile is a molecule in which one of the carbons has a triple bond to nitrogen. So essentially what that means, um, if you're an A2 chemist, then you'll have come across, um, you'll have come across uh, carbon triple bond nitrogen, but if you're a, a first-year chemist, you might not have done. So this is designed to sort of introduce you to the idea. So that's all they really mean. Carbon has a triple bond to nitrogen. So the structure of 2-methylpropane nitrile would simply be something like that. So in other words, what we're talking about, if you did it in displayed form, is something like that. So what they want is the structure and the systematic name of another nitrile, isomeric, with 2-methylpropane nitrile. So what they really mean is it's another molecule that has C3H5N as its uh, molecular formula, and it's also got the C triple bond, bond N functional group. So this one would be called butane nitrile because you have four carbons in the main carbon chain. And it would be just the same as changing from, I don't know, uh, two methylpropane to butane. They'd be isomeric with each other in the same way. So now what we've got to do, going down to B, is all the isomeric nitriles with the formula C5H9N. So probably now you're noticing they've warmed us up a little bit with some quite easy stuff, and now they're starting to challenge us. So I'm going to start off by drawing the straight chain. It's always a good idea to start with the straight chain, and then you can start branching and just checking all the time does it still match C5H9N. So that's our first one. There's another one. And there's a third one where you could move the methyl group along one. Now we can shorten the chain a bit. Now these are all the structural isomers, but if you're in A2, you may have come across optical isomerism. That's another type of stereo isomerism whereby four different uh, um, groups come off the same carbon atom. So it might also be worth considering whether there are any more chiral isomers. There may be something in there with uh, some of these where you could actually draw four different groups coming off the same carbon atom and therefore two mirrors Im mirror images of that version. But I'll leave that one for now. That's for the second years to have a think about. So if you're first year, don't worry too much about that for now. That'll come up in your second year. So let's move the page down a bit. Now it says, draw the structure of the linear molecule with the formula CHC11N. So the first thing to notice about this is there's actually very few hydrogens, only one nitrogen. So that's the obvious question, isn't it? How can one hydrogen and one nitrogen combine with 11 carbons? Now if you think about it, in the previous two questions, or previous two sections, you've been asked to consider triple bonds. A triple bond between nitrogen and carbon. 
If you think about your basic organic chemistry, uh, tr carbon can also triple bond to itself. So you could have a nitrile group on one side, and you could have a uh, a carbon-carbon triple bond with a hydrogen attached to that carbon on the other. So that now means that that gap between those can be populated by eight more carbons. So I've switched to skeletal form to actually uh, allow me to try and draw it. I haven't done a very good job of drawing it on the iPad, but the basic idea is you have alternating uh, carbon-carbon single and carbon-carbon triple bonds. So do try it out on a scrap of paper and see if it works for you. Do it um, displayed form so you can see what I mean. So this is where it starts to get harder. They let you sort of get used to the fact you're doing a chemistry Olympiad question. Um, the other thing that was in this, this particular section as well, where it says draw the structure of the linear molecule, which I forgot to mention, what that means is that the molecule has to be in a straight line, that shape has to be linear at all times. So when it starts talking about the signals detected in the radio wave reading of the electromagnetic spectrum, it starts to kind of move away from chemistry a little bit and start to get a bit mathematical, maybe a little bit um, quantum physics when it starts talking about Planck's constants, etc. So don't worry about that. They've got you started on it. They've got you relaxed and doing some fairly straightforward stuff. And now that you're up and running, you can have a think about how you might approach the harder part. So let's bring the page down again and we can see what we can do with this. So you can see in behind the page, down here, is page two of the question. I'll come on to that in a second. So let's focus on this formula, because we're obviously going to have to use this in part D. So the signals detected in the radio wave region of the electromagnetic spectrum are due to transitions between rotational energy levels, each of which has a particular energy. And the molecules have many rotational energy levels available to them, each level with a different energy being in, uh, specified by the so-called rotational quantum number, which takes integer values from zero upwards. So the energy of the jth rotational energy level, j is a number, is given by this formula which I've highlighted. So b is the rotational constant. h equals Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to minus 4 joules per second. And light of frequency f in hertz has energy h times f in joules. So lots of information there. Uh, let's see what they actually want us to do. So it says two signals have been detected due to HC11N, the molecule we've just drawn. So one is due to, um, to the transition from rotational energy level J equals 39 to J equals 38. The other due to transition level J equals 38 to J equals 37. So you can see they're pointed at those two, highlighted them, and said that J decreases by 1. And that's in, that's in both cases. But the formula we're given is J increases by 1, increases by 1, doesn't decrease by 1. So how do we do it for one where it decreases by 1? I'm going to do a little bit of mathematical trickery here. So what I've done is I've changed the formula that's highlighted very slightly. So instead of J... I've got j plus 1. Instead of j plus 1, I've got j plus 2. So you've still got two j values where one is bigger than another. So if you take, out, take the difference between those two, that will allow for a decrease in j of one value, one integer value. So now we have to combine our brackets. So the left-hand term in, in red can be factored down to j squared plus 3j plus 2. And the term on the right, the j term, can be turned into j squared plus j. So by cancelling on both sides with the j squared term first, the j terms second, that now allows us to put h times b times 2 in brackets, j plus 1. And that equals h times f. 
So why do I say that? That's because h times f is measured in hertz, which you can see up there. And the signal from j equals 39 to j equals 38, which we've just been spending a bit of time thinking about, is also measured in hertz. Or should I say megahertz? So because they're the same unit, they must mean the same thing. So because we're looking for B, we have to rearrange this formula so that B is a subject. So that cancels down to F divided by 2 times J plus 1. So if we now put the numbers in, like so, we can now calculate what the value of B is. Which gives us 169.0622179 megahertz. So let's now go on to page 2. So this one says one of the most abundant heteronuclear diatomic molecules detected in space is carbon monoxide formed from 12 carbon and 16 oxygen. So it gives you the masses in grams per mole to the minus 1, so that's relative formula mass, so it's a bit of first year chemistry again. Calculate the mass in kilogram of a single atom of each of these elements. So you need to use Abogadro's number. So you divide the mass in grams per mole by that number, which gives us 1.993 times 10 to the minus 23 grams. But they want us in kilograms, so you divide that by 1,000. So doing the same um, thing for uh, oxygen, like that, that'll give you 2.658 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. So the next one uh, says, when taking both masses of atoms into account in a diatomic molecule, we use the so-called reduced mass mu. So for a diatomic molecule with masses m1 and m2, mu is m1 times m2 over m1 plus m2. So it says, calculate the reduced mass of a molecule of 12C16O. So I've now labelled those two values as m1 and m2 in black, so you can insert those into the equation like that. Now that should give you 1.139 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. So then it comes back to a rotational constant. So for a diatomic molecule it gives you an equation for that, and it gives you r as the bond length, so you have to make R the subject. But to get there, you have to calculate B first. So we're making use of the calculation we did earlier. So what we did earlier was this, was to find that formula. So if we now take J as 0, we get that, and then from that we can say f equals 2b. So, let's work this out. So if the value of f this time is 115,271.204, that means b is that value divided by 2, because f is 2b. So moving down to the bottom left-hand corner of the page, we can rearrange the formula to find r squared as a subject. And we can put the values in now. So substituting all the numbers in and doing the calculation, and taking care of the units by cancelling, you get 1.2783 times 10 to the power of 20. Or I should have said 10 to the power of minus 20. Sorry about that. So r is obviously the square root of that which is 1.13 times 10 to the minus 10 metres. So now we have to move on to the next part. So I'm going to have to get rid of all of that calculation at the bottom. So it asks us to determine the transition. So they want j and j plus 1 this time. So it tells us that it's 806651.719. So it's quite simple, the maths here. It gives you a bit of a break. 
So you can clearly work out what 2j plus 1 is. So 2 in brackets, then j plus 1, close brackets, is 14. So j plus 1 is 7, j equals 6. So that means j equals 7 to j equals 6 must be the transition. So thanks for your time, thanks for your patience in seeing this with the end of the clip, and uh, see you soon.